But I want to talk about what it really means today to find God. You know, there's a story about a guy named Bill who went to a barber shop to have his hair cut and his beard trimmed. And as the barber began to work, they began to have a good conversation, telling stories as usual. You know, when you, ladies, when you go to the salon, guys, when you go to the barber, you know, you talk about anything. Sometimes you don't talk at all, but most of the time, once the talking starts, it talks. They talked about politics, elections, state of the economy, families, kids. But then they eventually touched on the subject of God. And Mike said, I don't believe God exists. Why do you say that, asked Bill. Well, you just have to go out in the street to realize that God doesn't exist. Well, tell me, Bill, if God exists, would there be so many sick people? Would there be abandoned children? If God existed, would there be neither suffering or pain? I can't imagine a loving God who would allow all these things. Bill thought for a moment, but didn't respond because he didn't want to start an argument. Mike finished his barbering job and Bill left the shop. Just after he left the barbershop, he saw a man in the street with long, stringy, dirty hair and an untrimmed beard. He looked dirty and unkempt. Bill turned back and entered the barbershop again, and he said to Mike, the barber, You know what? Barbers do not exist. How can you say that? asked the surprised barber. I am here, and I am a barber. And I just worked on you. No, Bill exclaimed. Barbers don't exist, because if they did, there would be no people with dirty, long hair and untrimmed beards like that man outside. Ah, but barbers do exist. That's what happens when people do not come to me, Mike the barber exclaimed. Exactly, Bill affirmed. That's the point. God, too, does exist. And that's what happens when people do not come to God, too. See, we need to find God. And if you don't go to God then you will be in a world that seems like there is no God because the blessings and the love has not got to you because God's plan is always meant for you to come to Him. Mm. So just as barbers exist, so does God. But see, if you don't go to the barber or the salon, just let your hair go for six months. Don't trim it. Don't touch the split ends. Just let it go. Don't comb it. Just wake up and go out and walk around. You will look like Sasquatch. <laughs> Bigfoot. Anybody know that one? I know that Bigfoot, Sasquatch, that big, huge, hairy monster that's supposed to be in the woods walking around somewhere, but no one saw him. <laughs> so you can say the same thing. We can look dirty, unkempt, untaken care of. Our lives can be hurting. Our lives can be falling apart. And we can walk around and go, there's no God. Where's God? If God was here. And we can talk about all the other people we see like that. Just like if you're a barber. There's no barber if you don't go to him and help clean you up, give you a shave, like make you look decent. So the title of the lesson is, you want God in your life, you must find him and then believe. You want to fix up your hair, you must go to the barber shop. You want to get your life fixed up, you need to go to God. So let's look at 2 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 1. And I want to uh, share with everybody, uh, I know uh, I'm so excited to meet at 2.30 with our Servants of Christ uh, leaders meeting, uh, and that is for all the members anytime, because obviously once we become disciples, we're supposed to teach each other in the world to help obey and learn how to grow in the knowledge of Christ. But we're going to meet at the new facility at the Canterbury Retreat and Conference Center. And Sonia has posted the address on the What's Up chat. chat. And we're going to meet at 2.30 in front of the main building. When you come in, you'll see us there. And then we're going to go on a little tour and show everybody. And then we're going to end up in, uh, uh, in this beautiful area that's there with the rotunda in the middle of the woods. So it's going to be exciting, and I hope you join us, but please be there at 2.30 so uh, you don't get lost in the forest. Amen? Uh, let's look at Second Chronicles in verse 15. And we read, and actually, and we're really going to focus in as I read these nine verses, but the key verses will be 3 and 4. So I'm going to read 3 and 4, and then we're going to do a running start and read 1 through 9. But in verse 3, it says, For a long time Israel 
was without the true God, without a priest to teach, and without the law. But in their distress, they turned to the Lord and the God of Israel and sought him, and he was found by them. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, God Almighty, as we look at your word right now, as we open the pages or however we're looking, we just help us to never forget that you carried certain servants along by your Holy Spirit to write down these words for eternity. Not only just for now, but the Bible, the word of God, is inspired by you. It's God-breathed. And Jesus even reiterates the world will pass away, but your words will never pass away. So as amazing as we look at it, we need to never stop being in awe of being able to open and have the access to your words in the Bible, the word of God. Even when the, word pa the world passes away and the end of the world comes, these eternal words will never pass away. This is eternal truth. Help us to look at it. Help us wherever we are, who's ever listening, help us to move everything out of our mind and just go, God, speak to me. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's look at now uh, in verse uh, 1. It says here, The Spirit of God came on Azariah, son of Odeth. He went out to meet Asa, which is King Asa, and said to him, Listen to me, Asa, and all Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you when you are with him. Wow. The Lord just isn't with me no matter what I do? No. He actually makes a very clear statement. This is a point through the whole Bible. The Lord is with you when you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. Wow. God's a loving God, I thought. Absolutely, he's a loving God. And he loves you even when you do forsake him because he allows you to stay alive. Even when your decisions hurt you and people and sins, he allows you to still have a time of staying alive. And, you know, tomorrow's not a point, not a promise to any of us. But if you're still alive and you haven't got right with God and looked into it, or if you have got right with God but you know you're slipping back into a sinful pattern and not dealing with it, don't continue to forsake him. He's waiting, but you've got to do your part. The Lord is with you when you are with him. Verse 3. For a long time, Israel was without the true God, without a priest to teach, and without the law. But in their d distress, they turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought him. And he was found by them. In those days, it was not safe to travel about. For all the inhabitants of the lands were in great turmoil. One nation was being crushed by another and one city by another because God was troubling them with every kind of distress. But as for you, be strong and do not give up for your work will be rewarded. When Asa heard these words in the prophecy of Azariah's son of Oded, the prophet, he took courage. See, the Bible, when you look at it with faith, it can actually change your demeanor. He heard these words and he took courage, even against the visual uh, uh, things that were going on on earth that time. It was crazy. It was like maybe we could even look at like in those Mad Max movies. It wasn't even safe to travel unless you were Justin and you had the how you doing uh, jujitsu ready to throw down. <laughs> We'd have to travel with someone that knows how to handle themselves. But... Asa heard these words and he took courage. When you read the Bible, do you get courage? Do you get comfort? Do you get mercy? Do you understand the loving kindness of repentance and God is going, I forgive you? That's what it means to go to God. It's incredible. Faith can change your, your direction, can change your, your belief, can open your eyes and help you overcome anything that you're down about or anything that you've been damaged about. So let's look in... Uh, in, in, in the second part of 8, it says, He removed the detestable idols from the whole land of Judah and Benjamin and from the towns he had captured in the hills of Ephraim. He repaired the altar of the Lord that was in front of the portico of the Lord's temple. Then he assembled all Judah and Benjamin and the people from Ephraim, Masasa, and Simeon, Simeon uh, who had settled among them for large numbers had come over to him 
from Israel when they saw that the Lord his God was with him. So here we see an incredible story. You know, this, uh, this is really the point. God's saying, you must understand, no one can begin to live successfully without knowing God. The first of all we must understand how we can come to him to really have our lives changed. And you can say, well, there's a lot of people that look successful and they don't seem to have God. See, you don't understand the deception of Satan. Jesus makes it very clear in one of the par parables in, the, in Luke about the rich man and Lazarus. And it says this rich man lived in luxury every day. And when he died, he was buried and then he went to hell. And, the, and, and, and Lazarus was a beggar and a man that really was in bad condition, sores all over him, sick. In a, in a perspective of a humanistic perspective, you look at the guy that's really wealthy, you go, that guy's got it all going on. And then you look at Lazarus, but God looks at the heart, so there was something wrong with the rich guy. Even though he may have said, thank you, God, his walk wasn't right. And if you look at that, he was self-involved. There was no room for God. And he went to hell. And the, what I'm trying to say is Jesus shocked the Jewish people back then because most, most of the people back then thought if you had prosperity, God was with you. And he's saying that is is. Partly true, but it also can be partly false. You cannot just think because things are going good with you materialistically that God is with you. You must look at the words of God and honor them. And the success that comes from that is the amazing joy and contentment that you start to receive in your heart and comfort despite outside circumstances. So as we look into this, we can see that the subject that we're going to be looking at in this verse, these nine verses is pinpointed in the three verses, in, in verse three and four that I read. The only one true God, the God of uh, and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says here very powerfully that if you, uh, if you seek him, he will be with you. So I want to ask you today, where are you with God? Because we're going to look at some deceptions here. Here's Israel without God. Now, what happened? Well, let's look into this. Asa welcomed people who had a close relationship with God in verse 1 and 2. And he, and he listened to their message. Azariah gave the armies an important warning and encouraged them to stay close to God. He said, stay close to God. And... He said, the Lord is with you when you are with him. And he said, you need to stay close to God. Stay with him. He's with you. Stay with him. And then he says, keep in contact with people who are filled with God's spirit so you will learn God's counsel. That means spend regular time in discussion and prayer with those who can help explain and apply the words of God. Talk about God. Pray to God. Read the word. And consume yourself with God. Surround yourself with influence and people who encourage you to keep the commitments you made to God and help each other walk in the light in the narrow road. Azariah said to Israel, the northern kingdom, because the kingdom was split. This is the problem. The northern kingdom was without the true God. Eight kings reigned in Israel during the 41-year rule of Asa in Judah. So King Asa led the kingdom in Judah, which stayed close to God. The kingdom split, and the other part of the kingdom, which unfortunately it did have a, a fracture, they had a problem with godly leadership and people that really wanted to follow God. And it says during that 41 rule, eight kings reigned there, and all eight were evil. Unbelievable. These are men of God that were raised to lead God's people and they went to the evil. Jeroboam was the first ruler of Israel and he began the wicked trend by setting up idols and expelling God's priests. Azariah used Israel's problem today and we could look at this example for us today as an example of the evil that would come to Judah if the people turned away from God as their northern brothers and sisters had. Today, it's all around us. We have a form of godliness in all around us in buildings and people who claim Jesus, but they, their life is not recognizable 
in the way the Word of God shows the pattern of life a man or woman aspires when they make Jesus Lord. And it Amen. doesn't mean that they are not without sin, but they agree and they're striving to stay close to God and they understand the grace and the mercy, not as a license just to do what they want, but as incredible motivation and courage and strength from God to be overcome their sin and know they're forgiven and loved, but their heart is with God. Amen. See, today we can use uh, this example of how many use and come in the name of Jesus. They'll say, Jesus Christ, I'm a Christian. You, you can say whatever you want, but the real acid test is when you die, what will he say? And you don't want to wait till you die and not truly and truly in your pride just continue to call yourself a Christian. No one's going to challenge you. No one, I mean, they may challenge you, but no one can tell you who you are if you're not humble. God, never, God won't even do that. But if you're not humble enough to be honest, and you die, you're going to be shocked. All you need to do is be humble and let the Word of God be and be honest with the Word of God and where there needs to be a change, change. And where you, you need to grow, grow. Amen. See, it's like the Word, uh, sometimes people can even not even know they're doing it, but, you know, uh, it's like the, the, there, was a, there was a word and uh, I forget the Disney show. He flew around on a carpet in the air. Aladdin. Aladdin. <laughs> and they went to a cave, and there was a cave, and they, they, they would say, Open Sesame. Is that the right movie? Yeah. Amen. <laughs> open Sesame, and it would open, but they had to find that password. Open Sesame, and the words were, the power of those words in that fable supernaturally opened the cave. But see, that's not the way God works. God doesn't go, it's just because you say Jesus Christ doesn't mean I'm going to open things to you if your heart and soul and mind and strength aren't behind it. You cannot honor me with your lips and your life is not aspiring to be what, I, what you say you are. And that's the real rubber in the road. We all need grace on our best day. See, Azariah, Azariah excuse me, encouraged the people of Judah to keep up the good work. He says, for your work will be rewarded in verse 7. You notice that? Look at verse 7 with me. But as for you, be strong and do not give up. For your work will be rewarded. See, work is in the Bible. We're not saved by works, but your faith and genuine saving faith shows that works will follow, not because you have to do it to be saved, because the true heart of a saved person by grace is motivated to do great things and want to serve God. You don't do it because you have to. You do it because you're moved to. And that's an evidence of saving grace. See, this is an inspiration for us. Recognition and reward are great motivators for people. Let's just be honest. And that, that's kind of what God knows too. It's not that you can't just do it because you're trying to get something and leave. But it is a motivator. Think about it in every area of your life. Your work, your school. There's motivators for working hard. Rewards. Raises. Trophies. Uh, plaques, uh, you know, that a boys, that a boy, that a boy, you know, on the back. Recognition. The temporal dimension would be the first one. I would say the temporal position, uh, uh, dimension is living by God's standards and remaining faithful to him uh, may result in your blessings on this earth in this lifetime, even when you go through trials. Because when you walk with God, he says he's going to take care of you. That's, that, that's, the, that's, the, that's the goal to stay faithful to the end. But the eternal dimension is after you die, you don't really die, you, you fall asleep. And this is amazing because as you live by faith and courage and continue to strive to be humble and obedient, you experience the fullness of God's presence and eternal life as you are faithful to God now and throughout your lives. The permanent recognition and reward will be given to you in the next life. So right now, as disciples, we have the promise of eternal life, which is the temporal dimension, which means we're going we're gonna to end in our human life. But we have the promise because of our walk and our, 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 our saying Jesus is Lord and the, and the grace that teaches us to want to love back and live for God is amazing. It keeps us motivated to do the work here and serve God, not because we have to, because we're blown away in gratitude from the cross. And then that eternal dimension, 10,000 years from now, where are you going to be? I love that question. You're going to be somewhere. I want to be with God. Point number one, are you dead or alive? Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. 
Are you dead or alive? And you might say, what are you talking about? I'm sitting right here listening to you. Now let's look. Verse 1, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us who lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. So here we see Paul speaking through the Spirit of God to the disciples in the city of Ephesus, which were called the Ephesians. It's a letter to the church in Ephesus. And all the letters are written to churches. And we know from God's point of view, biblically, who would he consider a member of his family? His church is a baptized disciple who is their sins forgiven, and they receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And it's the church started in Acts 2.38, where Peter preached the entrance. He had the keys, and that's where the beginning of the church began in 33 A.D. And we see here that before you understand Christ, you're still alive. You have the gift of life. You were born from your mother. And human life, the life, the life had to be breathed into you for the life. Everybody gets that. But that doesn't mean you're alive spiritually. And as amazing as the human body is, you still get the benefits of it, even if you're dead spiritually. Your mind is so powerful, it can keep you occupied away from God to the grave, which is actually a curse if you don't understand God. The gift of the human body is so amazing. If you don't want God, you can literally think you're making it through life because of the incredible creation of this body that you've been allowed to be put in, and you even forget who made that and who gave that to you. It's not you. You're just using this body and this brain. And when that all goes, that brain is going to be in the coffin. It's going to deteriorate and, and go into worm food. The spirit goes back to God. So this is just the car you're driving. But some of us look like this is my car. And it's not your car. It's God's car. But you can, he's not going to force it back. But you act like it's your car. And that's why it has knocks in it and little pings. Because you're not going to the great mechanic. And, and trusting him and obeying his way to run the car. It won't run smooth. Just like you have a car. If you don't look at the manual and don't change the oil ever, it's going to start to ping. It's going to start to run down. The engine's going to break down. It's not going to have that quality life of a car should have the way the manufacturer's manual has written you to take care of it. The Bible is our manufacturer. God gives us directions. It's basic instruction before leaving earth. Follow God's word for your life and you're going to run 200, 300,000 miles smooth. And God will continue to repair you as you need forgiveness and help. The greatest blessing which anyone can experience in this life is to find God, true God, not the counterfeits all over the place. There's a lot of counterfeit Jesuses. Most churches, there's a lot of menus out there. And you've got to figure that out. You've got to go, if I'm in a church, how do I know it's truth here. How do I know what it looks like? Well, you've got to study the Bible for yourself and ask questions. You've got to examine the scriptures, and whoever you're with, you've got to ask the people what they believe, and it's got to line up with the Bible. And even people, many people are just deceived. They don't even know. They're, they're, they're sincerely thinking they're doing it. But digging into the Bible and asking yourself questions and asking questions is not wrong. Because if anybody has an agenda versus just trying to find the answers, then they show their pride and defensiveness. Because why would someone argue if I go up to them and go, can you help me understand your salvation doctrine? The Bible says this, but you say this. And they start going on. I say, no, can you show me scripturally? I don't want to hear your song and dance talk. I want to, let's go to the Bible. No offense. I don't want to disrespect you. Can you just show me the Bible? It's not about me or you at churches. I just want to know what the truth is. Yeah. But the Bible speaks. And I'm not trying to, I don't have an agenda. If, if there's something you show me I'm not doing, I'm going to go, thank you. But the minute we start being defensive, it's sentimentality, and we start fighting for something other than really truth of God. Maybe our perspective of truth. We don't want to be challenged. I want to believe that this is God's way. But you have to be open to the scriptures for the rest of your life if you want to really stay close to God. And that, that, that means even when you're right with God as a true disciple. You need to continually be willing to change and grow, and when confronted with sin, be humble. The minute you stop responding correctly and humbly, you are in trouble with God. He's patient, but you're now putting up a flag of going, all right, you know, you've never argued with the words of God. 
You may wrestle, but you should always go help me get there. Point number two. True God, true comfort. Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Praise be, uh, chapter 1 verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us all in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. Mm. I don't know about you. That's awesome. Now, when you read that, you can go, well, I'm not comforted because this, this problem is still all over me. Well, that is not God's problem. That's your faith. You need to continue to go, where am I at? You can't just click open sesame when I'm in trouble. You can't just be a 911 God. God will say, I'm here, but it just doesn't magically go. you got to build your faith. you got to work through sins. you got to see where you're wrong. Because if you're living a life of sin, you, it takes repentance. It takes change. And God is not going to be leaving you, but he wants you to come to him. He can't just go, woo. If someone comes into the doctor and they're smoking a pack of cigarettes a day, and they continue to smoke, and you, you, you got emphysema, and you're going to get cancer. And the guy, then he comes in with emphysema. The doctor's going to say, you need to stop smoking. And we're going to try to repair this. But if you don't, and if you say, no, I want you just to fix me, but I'm going to keep doing what I want to do, it's like sin. You want, I want repair, God. I want comfort, but I'm going to not change. That's ridiculous. You'd never say that to a doctor. Yeah. If you have diabetes and he says, you're going to die, you're going to have to get your legs cut off if you don't change your diet. Well, that's going to be hard. Yeah, that's going to be hard. But what's better? What is it better? Would you rather lose your legs and keep eating like you're eating or change your eating for what to keep your legs? Jesus says the same thing spiritually. What good is it for a man to save his life but lose his very soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? He doesn't even go on at that. He says that question. We're all like, uh, there's no number, right? Eternity? What, 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 what is worth eternity? When you die and you make the wrong decision and you know forever and ever and ever and ever you can't change it, there's a chasm. I don't care what you're thinking. You're going to have regret the rest of your life because there's nothing more valuable than your walk with God in eternity. Amen. So true God, true comfort. Now, if you look back, if you look in uh, uh, verse chapter 2, verse uh, 12. Drop down to 12. I'm going to give a couple bullet points here. See, in Chronicles, they, it tells us that, that this had been true of them for a long time. They were godless. In, in Chronicles, it says, God was not present in your life for a long time. But in Ephesians 2.12, look what it says here. Remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel, and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. He's referring to the Israelites before God came in and they continued to come back. They were wandering in the desert. They, they had rebelled. There's many times they were without God, then they'd come back. The whole plan is if you're alive, there's hope. If your still heart is beating, no matter where you're at, no matter what situation you're in, there is grace and hope for you. The question is, what are you going to do? Or are you just going to lay in your trapped prison of sin and feel bad about yourself but never go after God? Then the problem is on you, not God, because God's going, I'm right here. My arm is not too short to save. Come on, brother. Nor my ears too dull to hear. But you continue to feel bad and think about it, but you're not putting me before yourself. You're not changing. You're not repenting. So... They were without the true God. And in Ephesians, we are without God because we're dead in our transgressions. So you've got to ask yourself, how, if you say I'm not dead in my transgressions, well, let me ask you, are you? Okay, well, if, you're in, if you look at the Bible and it shows any pattern of sin and you're continuing to consistently commit it, you're dead. Or you're just flat out arrogant and contemptuous with God and mocking him. Sexual morality. If you're having sex outside of marriage, you're dead in your sins. If you're impure consistently and not killing it, grace is there. But I'm talking about patterns. Keep doing it. And you say you know God and you're not dead, you're lying. If you're drinking and abusing alcohol or drugs or having secret sins or deceitful and you continue to not 
go after changing that and acknowledge that you need help, but you just keep mustering through and then saying, I'm, I know Jesus, you're deceived. You're pride. You're, you're dead. There's a pattern. We all need grace, but a pattern of the world or a pattern of God, the, it shows a consistency. It's like a stock market that does good over time. Sure, it's going to have ups and downs, but, it's all, but a really good stock is going to eventually continue to make progress over long-term low risk. God says, I'm going to work with you in grace. You're going to have ups and downs, and you're going to have battles and sins. But overall, if I look at your life, you're going to continue to fight, repent. For fight, repent, you're going to continue to grow and become more like Jesus. Yeah. Not like this. I became a Christian. Yay! You're kind of good like this. And then the rest of your life, it's like, it's like, where's God? Was that just the Jesus period? Was that just you found the Jesus time? Now you're back into nothing? Well, I don't think you found the true God. Because if you find the true God, you really tasted the real truth. It really experienced the power. How can you go back? Or maybe you just went through a religious experience and now you're in an institutionalized program of habit, but you feel nothing. Mm. But you keep going because the intellectual idea of heaven is really attractive. That's mm. what a lot of people get stuck in. See, Ephesians 2, it's a perfect description of the multitudes of people today. They are living without God. He does not enter into their thoughts except in times of emergency. And he does not... He's not been welcomed into their lives, except if they really are in a bad crisis, which is fine. God will take you anyway. But ask yourself, if you're living with God, are your thoughts continuously in God's word and thinking that way and wanting to grow and walk with God? Or are you just arguing about God but doing what you want? The Israelites still believed in the existence of God, and they experienced and benefited from his provinces, but for all that they were without the true God. See, people today are being blessed by God even if they don't want God. It rains on them. The sun shines on them. The sun grows crops. They're able to eat. They have water that's been given to them. God created water. They, they don't even realize they're waking up with their hearts. They, did, they didn't decide to wake up. God said, I'm going to keep you alive. I'm sustaining your life, but they give no credit. So that's the blessings of God for the wicked and the, and, and the good. The righteous and the unrighteous, God's still going, I love you both. And you're going to get benefits. But I hope you see that you need God because your life and spiritual morality and emotional makeup is going to start to get messed up because of sin. We are not told that we're without God. For anyone who worships a God of some kind, the God of self, money, pleasure, or ambition... These words in verse 3 are descriptive of many people. And go back to Chronicles, 2 Chronicles 15. Because if you look at that in verse 3 of 2 Chronicles 15, verse 3, it says, For a long time Israel was without the true God, without a priest to teach, and without the law. So it doesn't say that they're without a God, small g. Gods are, are idolatry, because if you're, everybody was built to worship, every human being, whether they use that word or not, worship something. Whatever's most important to you, follow that person around, you'll see what they're really excited about. And it is good to be excited about things, but the priority list is God is first. And if God is not first, and you're excited about other things, and that's more important in God's eyes, because what you do is really who you show you are and how you think. Mm. So you can be consumed... And you, you, may, you may still think, you, you, you may be without God, the true God Almighty, but you aren't without gods, small t. You, you can substitute that with self. You're the God of self. What you want to do and what you feel good, you're going to do. Money, pleasure, the pursuit of career, ambition, opposite sex, these can all take the place of God and you can be deceived. And they can keep you distracted to the grave without really ever finding the true God. Because for a long time they were without the true God. You know what? Everybody's without the true God initially because we have to be called out of darkness. Jesus wouldn't have died if, if there was another way. Every single person needs to come to the true God. They don't just naturally, you're not born into it. You don't just think through it. Like during your process of getting older, I just got mellower and that was my period with God. Or you can't just decide when you're right with God. You've got to come to God and figure out how he says to get right with God. Yeah. They also said one of the problems was is they stopped. They were without a teaching priest in, uh, in uh, Chronicles. 
They were without a teaching priest. And uh, it says that in verse... Oh, right. It was, for a long time, Israel was without the true God, without a priest to teach, and without the law. So they stopped letting godly leadership, and they stopped looking for godly leadership. They were without a priest. A teaching priest was one whose duty it was to teach the people the truth of God unapologetically. Who are the teaching priests today? Well, every person that opens the Bible and teaches is supposed to be a teaching priest correctly from the Word of God. Every disciple of Christ baptized is a priest. And you might go, what? Well, let's look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, because you might not think of that way. And don't think of priests like in priests you think of today. That's not what they're talking about. They're talking about this. It's not, it's not what you hear in the Word in certain, certain denominations about priests. That would be false. Here it says here, uh, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9, it says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you've received mercy. So you see, you, everybody is in the darkness and has to understand who the true God is and who Jesus is and why he came. And it's not just an intellectual, emotional thing. You've got to come to God. And, and, and it says once you do that and you are called into the light, you're now a part of a royal priesthood. You're a people of God. You're the family of God. Isn't that amazing? A holy, special possession. But a royal priesthood means... Just as Jesus says, go make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I'll be with you always to the end of the age. See, he says, go make disciples. Once you become a disciple of Christ and you're saved, now how do you make a disciple without being able to handle the word of God correctly as a royal priesthood and teach others the word of God correctly? That's what got way out of whack. It's the, everybody thinks just the minister is the guy that you go to. No, every disciple should be growing and really going, God, I know that the expectation is for me to grow in the Lord, but learn how to communicate your word to others and teach why I believe what I believe and help the truth be corrected. Are you living out your priesthood, being a light for truth to those who are without God? Or are you so lukewarm or weak or, or frightened that people even bring up the Lord and whatnot and you know they're misguided or it could be correct you're not judging but not even to breach it you just kind of don't want any conflict you want to get along with everybody you need to not be disrespectful but you need to be concerned if you get to know someone and you hear their as they may be talking you can understand if they express the way they were uh, saved or how they're walking with God you can start to pick up things and ask questions not in a judgmental way but hey man I see you love God. What, what, what you said here, what, what does that mean? Like, can you teach, help me understand that? Because you care. And if you're wrong, you go, oh, okay. But when you look at the Bible, you've got to go, well, that's not what the Bible, I read the Bible here, and I was just wanting to see uh, if I'm incorrect. But it's really going, hey, I'm not afraid to ask questions about the Bible. Let's go back to the Bible. And, 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 but you also want to help anybody, and that's the way you should want to be helped. That takes boldness. That takes fear of uh, rocking the boat. You're not trying to rock the boat, but the truth is the truth is the truth from the Bible. Mm. They were without the law in verse 3. They were without priests and the law. That would be the Bible. The words of God. The priests were guardians of the law back then in the Chronicles. And to be without a priest meant, therefore, you were without the law. And if anyone wanted to know the law in those days, he had to go to a priest. But thankful, God now has given us his law to everyone, which is now the words of God, which is the Bible. However, the majority of people do not read the Bible still today, and therefore they are without the law, even though it's the most prevalent, accessible book on the planet. It may be in their houses, but they don't, they're without it because they don't really go to it in that serious conviction of love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. You're going to love God's word. Amen. The Bible is God's standard of what is right and wrong. But the vast majority 
of people take their stand, take their standards from subconsciously even without from the media, the newspaper, news programs, the radio, music, television, cinema, film. I mean, they 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 may not say that, but they just kind of that's the pattern of the world. And therefore, because God's standard has been rejected and the world's or man's or the devil's standard has been substituted, our civilization has become and is becoming increasingly more corrupted. We are technologically more advanced than ever in the world. We have invented the most incredible technology that makes our lives easier. We, we have very incredible, we, we can go in space, we can cure vaccines. I mean, the COVID, I will bet because of the ingenuity of human beings and the gifts that God gave their brains, I will bet that the, we're gonna, that cure is going to pop up sometime in the near future, just like they did other things. God has allowed man to do many things. But one thing he's not allowed him to do is a good moral life without the true God will not save you. See, the most wicked choice a person can make is aspire to be a good person and think they're going to enter heaven like that. That's the wrong thing to focus on. No one is good. You need to aspire to be faithful in Christ and be strong in the grace. When trouble came, they turned to God in verse 4. But in their distress, they turned to the Lord. And the Lord God of Israel sought them, and, and, and he was found by them. So they turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought God, and he was found by them. Now think about that. Wherever you're at, wherever any human being's up, you realize whose problem is it? God's or the person that's struggling and bitter and challenged and complaining? It's not God's. God says he's right there. And if you're in distress and you're still out to lunch and hurting, struggling, then why aren't you turning to God and seeking him with all your heart and be found? Why aren't you open to to going against your understanding of God and looking at the Bible honestly instead of fighting with your own intellectual understanding of what you think God is without bringing the Bible into it. And then if the Bible isn't bringing it, why do you get so argumentative and attacked and challenged and have your guard up? And then why do you call people that may be walking in the light as disciples, cult members, when you are part of a church that you know is not calling you to live as a disciple of Jesus the way the Bible defines, not church. Because it's easy. If I don't want to hear the whole truth and I'm fine, I'm right with God, I got God, I think. And then someone comes in and I notice somebody living in a different way. And I notice their lifestyle is more close to God. And they're, they're observing. I know the Bible says and they're actually doing it. I go, I didn't know people really did it. So either I'm going to have to go, I need to learn some more stuff, and maybe perhaps I'm not saved because I'm hearing things that are, uh, that are tickling and itch, like burning my ears, and I, I, I'm afraid to ask because I don't want to be confronted to realize I'm not right. I don't want to have to be challenged on some of these things I know possibly are sin, but I just convince myself that this unrealistic grace just God understands. No, he does not understand if you're allowing sin to still be in your life and you're starting to stay far enough like ignorance is bliss. It's not going to be a, an understandable excuse at judgment because mm. he's given you the word. He says if you're in distress, you need to seek him. And that means humble out to the words of God, the whole words of God, and no massaging with false doctrine churches that have added to the Bible. And you see a bunch of people that sit in a pew every Sunday, and from Sunday to Sunday, their lives are unrecognizable as the pattern of disciples working together, growing in the Lord, loving God, and then loving others by bringing the message and helping others understand the truth and making disciples evangelizing the world, as God says, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Yep. Yeah. That terrifies and challenges people. So if they don't want to do it, they're going to go, that's a cult. Well, that's such an easy word to use. People throw that word out like it's donuts. <laughs> you say something's a cult, it just eases your mind. Cult! Now it just makes you go back. It's a cult. And you get around other people that are bitter because they don't want to follow the Bible. Cult, 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 cult. <laughs> just that word just disarms everything. Cult, yeah, go back. Give me another booze. I can do whatever I want. I can make up the rules. I'm a Christian. I love God, but I'm going to sleep with women and men before I'm married because God understands. 
I believe in abortion because you can't blame the people. They had the baby. They can't afford it. Oh, but they're saying abortion sin. It's killing a baby. They're saying homosexuality sin. That's not what God created you as a man and a woman. That's on his plan. They're saying that drunkenness and self-centeredness and, and having a form of godliness but denying its power and not really following Jesus and giving your whole heart and love to God first. No, that's fanatical. They're freaks. Jesus, that's a cult. Come on. Then, then, then what are you doing? Who's making disciples in your life? What are you doing in the way the gospel does? Show me a better way. Show me something that I need to learn that can be more effective and productive in God's eyes. Come teach me. Come teach anyone. Every disciple wants to learn from God and people how to help other people and love deeply. So if you use that word, most of the time, you're a coward. You're defensive and prideful and you don't want to hear it. And the bottom line is you never got in the Bible and sat there and said, let's just look at the words of God and let that be a mirror. And own what you need to own. I do that every day and I'm free. And that's what grace means. I go, I'm not afraid. I go, God. Oh, thanks. I need to work on this. And I get open. I talk to my wife. I talk to people. I go, this is, I need to work on being more gentle with my wife. I'm not going, I'm good enough. God, you know, no. I want to continue to change and grow as God is patient and loving and wants to help me. That's the response of grace. Come on, your grace. distress may be your door to find God. Look in verse 4 of 2 Chronicles 15. Verse 4, but in their distress, they turned to the Lord, and the God of Israel sought him. And, and, and the God of Israel, and they sought him, and he was found by them. See, if you turn to God, you got to seek him. They sought him. It's not just, where is he? Oh, there he is. Hey, just want to make sure I can see him. No, find him. Turn to him. Now seek him. What's that mean, sought him? That means understand what he requires and what he calls you to do and how he wants you to live and what pleases God, what you want to do. You want to find out, you want to love what God loves and hate what God hates. That's what, that's what seeking God and finding God. You want to love what God loves and hate what God hates. God hates sin. He doesn't hate the sinners, but he wants you to change that sin. He gave his son to die for it. So if you're in distress, it may be a great thing. It could be a blessing if you're humble and go, well, I finally need to admit something's wrong. See, to seek God means you turn from God and from self. And that would be repentance. Look in 1 Thessalonians 1 9. You guys all with me? Yeah. Come on, I can hear you through the TV. How you doing? <laughs> 1 Thessalonians. See, and, and, and I'm just saying that there's a battle of Satan here, and that Jesus says the road is narrow. And many times he says, if the people hate me, they're going to hate you. They're, if the world hates me, they're going to hate you. He talks about blessed are those who lie and insult and say all kinds of things about you because of me. Because you're in good company. The prophets were murdered and killed as well because of me. So that's good company. When you finally start to get a challenge or attacked or, or eat by religious people because they're they, they attacking, you just got to go, what's the problem? Let's look at the Bible. One thing I've, not, I've found in 26 years, like if, if someone's willing to sit down, I'm never like defending anything, but let's, what, let's just see. I love the Bible because you can just go, what's it say? What's it say? And you just let it speak. And you find out the more you learn the Bible, if every humble, there's not even an issue. But most people won't go there if they have pride. But they'll say what they think. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 9. For they themselves reported, report what kind of reception you gave us. They tell how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God and to wait for his son from heaven, who he raised from the dead, Jesus, who rescues us from the coming wrath. Aren't you fired up that you're rescued from the coming wrath? See, you've got to turn to God. You've got to realize you need to be rescued. That would be saved. I need a lot of help. If you're staying in sin and defending your religious pride, you're so deceived. Please humble out. See, people that walk away from God, they can't say they're walking away from God because intellectually their brains are too advanced. God gave us brains. How can someone intellectually go, I'm walking away from God? They're going to find people that have watered it down where they can still find a form of God that has no power and convince themselves that they're okay. Literally, people can say, you could just meet in a restaurant, come outside, say a prayer with me, and I go on. Then they go on, I, I, I pray, I met this guy, I'm eating eggs, and he took me out back and said, you believe in Jesus? I mean, good night. 
Drinking Kool-Aid, good night. Think about that. Does that really make sense? Yeah, you're, you're saved by belief and faith. But faith is accompanied by obedience and a relationship loving and walking with God. So people that lose their love for God lose their connection with the invisible God. Now they're in a group of people that the church is part of God's church. But if you lose the obedience and love for God, then you're even in a real church. You're going to start seeing, and now you're going to look at things that God calls you to do because you don't want to deny yourself anymore because you're back in self. But you're going, oh. so they're saying, God says, you're the light of the world. Go make disciples. Be fishers of men. So if someone says, hey, let's go out to a movie. Well, you want to meet early and maybe we can look and pray and we can share our faith with somebody. And once they lose that love for God, then they start to say, they want us to go to the mall and recruit people. They want us to go get people. Good night. That's such a spin, isn't it? That's a satanic lie. Go get people. Convert people. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. We can't get anybody, but we need to not be shy. Go, God saved me. And you talk about it. If someone's open, you go, this is the plan. You want to study the Bible? We're not supposed to be shy like that, but never the word recruit. What's that mean? I want to recruit you into the KGB. I want to recruit you into CIA. This isn't a Jason Bourne movie. Mm -hmm. How you doing? Come on, bro. Seek the Lord and his pardon. Look at Isaiah, Isaiah 55, 6. Isaiah 55, 6. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them... Turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on them, and to our God, for he will freely pardon. That's awesome. There's no excuse. Christian, non-Christian, repentance is a blessing. Mm -hmm. So incredible. Seek the Lord, and he'll pardon you. you got to be honest, though. Are you living the life Jesus called you to live? Not in guilt. That We're all working on stuff. We're all falling short. That's not what God wants. God wants you to be willing to be teachable. And want to train, because Jesus says, who is weary? Come to me. I am gentle and humble in heart, and I will help you. I see you're weary. It's not about get up and do it. No, it's about I want to I want to grow. No one's, there's no stand, there's no like uh, marker for humans. We're all striving to go, God, just help use me, help mold me, help me change, give me strength. That's the heart of grace. So seek the Lord and his pardon. You need to you want to get you want to get pardoned, but you got to be honest and real and realize that all of me is yours now, not some. You can't have compartmentalizing with God. You get this part, but this part's mine. God's going to give you back a better life. He's designed you to have to prosper, have a future and love him and realize his dream of walking with him is really the best dream if you can just trust it. The the, the other thing it says here, you know, how wonderfully this little bit of ancient history ends in 2 Chronicles. This is ancient history, by the way, but it's still God. Uh, in, in verse uh, 15, let's go down to verse 15. Or, or excuse me, sorry. Before you go to that, go to Proverbs 8, 17. Because I have to read. I put this in there. It's my last scripture, and then we're going to go to, we're going to close out at 5 Chronicles. But look at Proverbs 8, 17. This is such a great proverb. So simple. Love those who love me. I love those who love me, and those who seek me find me. Oh my gosh, I can't find God. I don't understand God. What? Here it is. Now you need to maybe pray for faith and be open and, and not give up like the persistent widow we looked at last week. Remember? Mm -hmm. he, he, he said, don't give up. You need to pray and not give up. Will you find faith? God's not trying to make you beg. He's trying to help you grow in your faith to see that persistence and truth never changes, and it will come through, but he's always doing something. Not on your time. I love those who love me. Wow, that's, that sounds kind of conditional. Well, it is. God made us. He decides that. He's still good. He's still waiting. He wants you to come to him. But if you die apart from him, and then you go, oh, no, oh, I want you now. That's a selfish thing. You can't come into God with sin. It's a selfish thing because he knows you're going, oh, I'd rather go to heaven and hell, but I really don't care about you, but I want the best deal for me. That, that Your heart's going to be wrong. God can't let you come in because he can't be in the presence of unrepented sin. It's just self-seeking what's best and manipulating. So if you love God, you're gonna. If you want to be in heaven, you're gonna to want to be part of heaven now, and that's the kingdom of God on earth. Look at Second Chronicles 15, in verse 12, and we're gonna close out here. This is incredible because this ancient book, Second Chronicles 15, it's an incredible little bit 
of showing how it ends when people finally really go, I want God. I really want God. Now let's read this in verse 12. They entered into a covenant to seek God. And the God, the God of their ancestors, with all their heart and soul, all who would not seek the Lord, the God of Israel, were put to death, whether small or great, man or woman. They took an oath to the Lord with a loud acclamation, with shouting and with the trumpets and horns. All Judah rejoiced with the oath because they had sworn it wholeheartedly. See, when you're baptized, you say, Jesus is Lord. And they say, because of your great confession, you're now able to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins and you receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and you will be added to God's eternal kingdom because of your wholehearted conviction that Jesus is Lord. And then it says here, they sought God eagerly and he was found by them. So the Lord gave them the rest on every side. King Asa also disposed his grandmother Makkah from her position as queen mother because she had made a repulsive image for the worship of Asherah. Asa cut it down, broke it up, and burned it in the Kidron Valley. Although he did not remove the high places from Israel's, uh, Israel, Asa's heart was fully committed to the Lord all his life. He brought into the temple of God the silver and gold and articles that he and his father had dedicated, there was no more war until the 35th year of Asa's reign. See, this is really what's great when you make a decision, and it doesn't matter. Even as disciples, you hear the word of God, you go, I want to take it up. I want to grow, or you've been cut. i got a deal. i got to have a conversation. I need to change this sinful thing that I've not talked about. I, need to, I, I want to show God I want help. If you're not right with God, and you're standing there defensively and going, I'm fine, you, need to not, you didn't hear the words of God. This is not just half-heartedly. It's all in or not in. That's God's call. And it doesn't mean you have to be perfect. You just need to be willing the heart of God. The heart. It's a willingness. you got grace. You're going to have love. You're going to have patience. It's just a willingness. Even the mother, the grandmother, you can't have sentimentality. Look at King A said, no, you're done. Grandma, you're going you're gonna, you're gonna to put aside. Because you're not, you're not honoring God. I'm not just going to baby you. I'm going to tell you the truth. Look at it. He disposed his grandmother Makkah and her position as queen mother because she had made a repulsive image from the worship, for the worship of Asherah. He cut it down. So you may talk to your relatives and you're afraid to bring up the real truth because they've been going to some dead church that doesn't teach true doctrine forever. You don't want to hurt their feelings. Well, you better hurt their feelings now than wait till they die because their feelings are really going to be hurt if they're, in, if they're not in a truth. You need to pray for wisdom. And I'm not saying to be mean and be respect, not respectful. But if you know they're not taught correctly, there's got to be a prayer to go, hey, would you like to look at some scriptures? This is what I'm learning. you got to get into it sometimes to get into it. And it doesn't mean you're fighting. you just got to bring it up. If you just be quiet walk on eggshells every Thanksgiving visit, what are you going to do at judgment? I knew the truth, but I didn't want to bring it up because I didn't want to have a bad Thanksgiving. I'm sorry, that's the rub. you got to love God. you got to be willing to not, you don't change anybody, you don't, you don't argue. You bring up the truth that they are defensive, and you offer, hey, would you like to look at the scriptures? I learned some things. They said, not right now. Okay. If you ever do, I'm just shocked because I really learned a lot. I was blown away at some things I didn't understand, and I realized it helped me a lot. And I just love you so much. I'd like to be willing to share what I've learned anytime. Amen. And I'm praying for you because I love you so much, Grandma. And I really appreciate all those little checks you gave me at birthday and the cakes and the love. <laughs> so you still acknowledge what you love, but the truth is the truth. So... You want God in your life, you must find Him and seek Him and turn to Him and wholeheartedly follow Him and to death do us part. Amen. Amen.